Jim, how are you doing today? You know, I'm sitting here looking out the window, and we've had some warm weather, not a lot. We've had a lot of rain, way more than I'd like, but I'm looking at green grass. What what do we need to do next? In our bees or the weather? I can't I can't help you with the weather. <laughs> <laughs> but with the bees, I know exactly what I need to do. Uh, if this is on your mind, you want to talk about it some in just a bit. I've got some odds and ends that need to be done. Okay. Well, hi, I'm Kim Flodham. And I'm Jim Tew. And I think what we're going to talk about today is what to do in spring on Honeybee Obscura. You are listening to Honeybee Obscura, brought to you by Growing Planet Media, the folks behind Beekeeping Today podcast. Each week on Honeybee Obscura, hosts Kim Flodham and Jim Tu explore the complexities, the beauty, the fun, and the challenges of managing honeybees in today's world. Get ready for an engaging discussion to delight and inform all beekeepers. If you're a long timer or just starting out, Sit back and enjoy the next several minutes as Kim and Jim explore all things honeybees. All right, you got a list of things. At least you got a list of things. I I'm, I'm, I can't even find my desk anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I was <laughs> amused when you said I have a list. A, a list is something I plan to do for the day, but then I never do anything on the list. I do other things I never dreamed I would be doing. I as did you, just went through a really meaningful windstorm. I read from the electric power company that they were wind gusts up to 60 miles an hour. Yeah, we had it here, too. And, uh, and all kind of things blew around in my bee yard. I went out, and there were tops blown off, and I thought, if you put them back on, they're just going to blow off again and maybe worse. So one of the things I've got to do, you know, just as has an immediate need, is clean up. And I'm not a neat freak. Boy, I'll tell you, look at any of my pictures that I publish. You can tell I'm not uh, really concerned about ultimate neatness in my yard. But I've got to clean up enough to be able to walk and to find things and be organized. <laughs> you can't be stumbling over old frames and spell boxes. So all that's got to be picked up that blew over and, you know, just through the winter, things got messy. So it doesn't have anything to do with ultimate bee management and varroa control and all that. It just has everything to do with being organized and be able to get your thoughts together to make that list you talked about. I'm listening to you here. There's two things that come to mind right away. One is to get out to my bees, I need waders because the ground is so wet. We've had so much rain the last week or so. But the other thing is, you know, they make a they make a thing for that to keep those covers on. It's called a rock. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I've never had this happen. I'm still stinging from it. I had bricks on the top. I had bricks. I didn't have rocks. I had construction bricks. Okay. And that's the first time that I can think of. Well, honestly, Kim, I can never think of another instance where some tops blew off that had bricks on them. So if you can see some bee yard humor here, now i got to pick up tops and bricks that are scattered all <laughs> over. And i got to get those bricks out of the grass before I find them with a lawnmower here in a few months. Yeah. Yep. None of this is exciting yep. for our listeners, I know, I know. What I've really got to do, Kim, just as soon as I can, is address my annual, seasonal, I don't want to do this varroa control process. I, I want to work bees. I don't want to work varroa. So I'm always begrudged having to go out and do these varroa control things to get them suppressed so that the bees can build up enough that we can tolerate them throughout the season. That has to be one of the things I do first because the more they brood up, then the more difficult it's going to be to put some kind of control on that uh, will knock varroa down with all that brood there. Yeah, I gotta do the same. Uh, I haven't I haven't opened a colony yet, either by the wind or by myself. But you're right; it's uh, the time of year to stop them before they start growing the populations. So I, I'm gonna have to look into that. There's some. There's there, you know. Which which one of these chemicals do you choose? And I don't know anymore. I'm gonna have to go back and take a look. But before I get to Varroa, I want to. What I want to do. This is a good time of year for me to. 
I got my bees facing a, a field with a with a big berm in it. They're, they're sitting next to a berm. And I had that put in a bunch of years ago when they dug me a new trench out front and they put the berm up in front of my colonies or where the colonies are now. And of course, you can't mow a berm. You know, it's kind of steep and rough. So you got to go in and weed whack it. And if you get if you get there in time, you can kind of keep it under control. But last fall, I didn't keep anything under control. So I got to get in there and, and clear out the, the space in front of the colonies so that when they start flying, they can get out. Good point. Uh, what a guy named Jim Tew would do would be on that berm plant wildflowers and then tell everybody it's a wildflower garden and let it go, let it go crazy up there instead of having <laughs> to trim it back down because... I don't want to sound like I'm an old guy, but that weed trimming thing isn't enjoyable as it used to be, and invariably the weeds just grow back. Yeah. Well, that's what they did last year. I got rid of them in the spring, and then once in the summer I pruned them back, and then last fall got all messed up, and I didn't yeah. get back to it. So they can barely get out. There's so many weeds that you can't see the entrances mostly no, on, you gotta, on any of them. you got to knock there. it down some. I mean, they, they yep. will work it out themselves. But it just makes life easier for them and for you. I I made a bold statement. Don't worry about the grass. You know, just just let it go and work on things that are more important. But what I found out, you can't walk in <laughs> one foot tall grass carrying a deep full of honey w- without running a real risk of you and that honey falling. So I had to go back and change my mind on that. I have to cut grass periodically just so I can able to to walk carrying a load but that's that's not uh, grass cuttings in the future for me it's we're not to that point at all so i got to clean up i got to clean up i got to do something about varroa well you just touched on a good point is over the course of a summer stuff falls on the ground it doesn't get picked up and then a little bit more something else falls on the ground doesn't get picked up and pretty soon the grass is around it, and you can't see it. So you, one of those bricks that blew off the top of your colony, it gets covered with grass here in the next couple, three weeks. One day you're going to go out there, and you're going to find that brick the hard way. No, I, I was serious about that. I've never hit a brick. I've hit other things. But I don't I don't want to take my old mower and add to my problems by having to fix a mower because I tried to <laughs> cut a brick. <laughs> The other thing that needs to be done fairly soon is reversing deeps. Are you a deep reverser, brood nest reverser? No, and it's because I don't have deeps. I have everything in eight-frame mediums. But the, the concept of moving the population of bees from the top of the hive to the bottom of the hive works the same way. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You, you have to reverse, maybe not deeps, but you have to reverse the equipment. Well, it's a shame that if I did the Varroa thing right and I had the yard reasonably cleaned up and my queens are functioning nicely, and I, all I've done now is encourage swarming by not by not taking care of that. So I don't want to do all these other good things just to watch the bees all fly away here in a few few months. I guess that's pretty much what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to – one of the things I want to think about – later this summer that I'm going to have to get ready for now is moving that moving that hive stand I've got uh, a little it's it's in a it faces a berm and and the berm to get in and clean up the berm um, which is about probably three feet tall to get in there and clean that up and when I say it faces it, the, the hives are st- sitting right on the edge of it, the hive stands right on the edge of it so so I got to get in and clean up that berm before it grows up and or move the hive stand and you you had you, you how do your hive stands work you got one colony per hive stand i tried to tinker with the whole concept of hive stands as you know nothing about hive stands is standardized and uh, you can really get some nice pieces of equipment you know, in fact, it's probably a good time to hear somebody who could really come up with some nice hive stands for you. Let's take a break and hear from them. We know you have options when it comes to shopping for beekeeping supplies. 
What we believe sets Better Be Apart are three things. First, our commitment to innovating, trying out new products in our own apiaries, and then sharing them with you. Second, our focus on education and helpful customer service. And third, but not last, our fundamental company goal, to help you be a successful beekeeper. Give us a call to learn more about any of our products or to ask a beekeeping question. We've got you covered. Visit BetterBee.com to shop online today. I have, as I sit here thinking, probably five or six different kinds of hive stands. I don't mean to be too obvious here, but one of the hive stands that I use a lot that's worked well for me has been uh, the hive stand for the, by BeeSmart that has uh, got two, diff- two different models through the years they've evolved. Those work well. I've got a lot of hive stands that various people built. A lot of my Amish friends are clever, and they'll knock out their concept of a hive design, of a hive stand design. And I've got a really nice unit that I picked up that's an adjustable stand that you can, the length of the two befores, there's two of them, determines if you can put two or three or maybe four colonies on that stand. So it's an adjustable stand. There's no, I mean, I I did an article years ago, and there must be 25 different hive stands. So (laughs) when your worst comes to worst comes to worst, put them back on cement blocks like we did for the last 10,000 years. How did we get off on hive stands? You brought this up. Well, I got I, I got to move my hives, and I'm going to, you know, do I just take them off the existing hive stand, move the hive stand to where I want them to be and put the stuff back on, or do I want to explore this a little bit further and maybe change how I do yeah. this? And you're, uh, I'm looking at one hive per stand or maybe several hives on a hive stand, and... They all have pluses and minuses. They certainly do. The main thing I've, that I've always wanted was them to stay level. And since we're totally off the subject, one of the things I, I did is I used uh, the platform, the, pl- the heavy-duty plastic platform that typically goes under air conditioner compressors that sit by your house. It's, it's yeah. about four feet square, maybe three and a half feet square, heavy plastic, and it, it levels, it kind of sinks into the ground in a reasonably level way. If I had endless money, I would probably have those things under my beehives, but I don't have endless money. They're not cheap. They're kind of big to handle, but the three I do have do a great job with a beehive sitting on it. So that's got nothing to do with what we're doing for spring maintenance. And either I've lured you off the subject or you lured me off the subject. But we need at some point, Kim, to open those bees. So one of the things I've got (laughs) to do when I'm reversing is just checking for food stores and any other disease issue. How's the queen productivity looking? And this brings me to, a, for me, a troubling point. On those nice days, and every day that, that comes along here in Ohio, it's not a great bee day. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so t- absolutely. Today, today might come around, but right now it's not a great bee day. It rained all night. So if the day comes around and those maples that are in bloom right now are able to do their thing and lure bees to them for pollen and some nectar sources, is it a good day for me to go out and disrupt them? And check brood patterns and be looking, you know, pawing through a hive, checking queen productivity on that rare day when the bees need to be out working too. So I, my question to you and anybody who wants to have an opinion, whose who's task how priority, the bees or the beekeepers? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I think about that because I've wrestled with that too, but you're, if you go out there on that one nice day we get this time of year and go through and do all the things you want to do, you're going to mess up that colony maybe for a half a day at most, probably less than that. But if you don't do it now and they run out of food because you didn't check or Varroa gets out of control because you didn't check or you know all sorts of things can go wrong 
if you don't check soon enough. So you sacri- to me, I sacrifice, I sacrifice a couple hours of their day versus the rest of the season. You know, that's a great point. That's a great way of looking at it. It's short-term loss for long-term gain in theory yep. because we have, to as- we have to assume that good days are in the future, that it won't just be raining every day or cold every day. But I feel so guilty, Kim, on, the, on those rare, nice days. It was 60 degrees yesterday, and the bee pollen was coming in, and bees were flying, and they didn't care if I was back there. They were distracted. They had things to do. And I thought, you know, this is the day that I'm supposed to fire off my smoker and disrupt all of this and go in and check brood and reverse brood boxes. And so I didn't do it. Am I being lazy? Am I being considerate? I've done I've done both. <laughs> I've 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 been lazy, or I've I've put it off because I, in my mind I've got other important things that need to get done, and there's been some years where I've been really aggressive about this and making sure things get done on time, the right way, and all of that. And you know, over thirty years, it balances out. Yeah, I thought you were going to say nobody died. A came famous <laughs> Kim Flotum euphemism. Nobody died. <laughs> it balances out. Right, right. Yep, it does. Jeff and I just recently, thinking of things balancing out, did a podcast on painting beehives. You know, if you're going to paint, you can paint all summer, but then the spring's probably a good time to do it. You get a good start, and, and the weather's not so hot yet, and the bees are in a good mood. So, it's, you know, it really depends on what things we should be doing right now. And number one, I, I've told you, I need to control Varroa. Number two, they got to have food. And number three, everything else, Kim Flottam said, it balances out. So <laughs> a lot of that's true. Beyond the, beyond the big issues, the smaller issues that come up, you need to decide how neat you want the yard to be or whether or not you're putting pollen patties on. You know, the elephant in the room we haven't discussed, Kim, is what we should be doing for packages and splits if we're going to be getting any. So it's Ooh, too, yeah. late, too late to go in that. But right now, while you're back in that bee yard, assaying dead outs and weak colonies and the packages you should be ordering, then that opens up an entire different arena for work that needs to be done to prepare for those new bees coming in. Well, back up a half a step. I think you nailed the the priorities here in a good order. The first thing that needs to get done is Varroa. The second thing is food. And the third thing is room. And, and if you, I think if you consistent every year, if you take care of Varroa now, and then maybe later in the late summer, if the population doesn't build up too fast, take care of Varroa, check for food so that when the queen starts laying, there's enough food to feed all that brood she's going to make. And the third thing is make sure you've got room to stop swarming so that when all that food that you gave them and they built up and then they take it and leave. Yep. So I think, I think, I think you nailed it on, on a, priorities there. Great list. I'm, I'm, you know, I think I'll do every one of those things just as soon as it stops raining. <laughs> <laughs> and I become a young man again. I'm going to go out and do every one of those. I, I am going okay. to do this, Kim. Well, I'm glad. Right. You know, well, I'm impatient. Listeners and Kim, I'm impatient. I know a lot of you have already been through spring and already hived some swarms. Others of you have still got feet and feet of snow. I, I'm ready to go now. We talked about it, and we talked about it, and we talked about it. I, I want to go out and do something with my bees, and it's just not quite time yet. Well, I'll let you. I'll, I'll just, I'll just get out of your way and let you go. And next time we get back, we'll talk about one of these things, or maybe more, or something else. I'll look forward to it. All right. 